Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, just left out for a glass of water there. Didn't realise it was going to be called first. Um, with your permission, I wish to make a statement on the meeting of the Interministerial Group for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs meeting, which took place on the 17th of February uh, 2020. <clears throat> the meeting provides central coordination and promotion of greater collaboration in areas of shared interest between portfolio ministers dealing in agriculture, fisheries, environment, forestry and rural affairs within the UK administrations. The meeting considers policy, delivery, technical and legislative matters where the administrators, administrations have determined, determined to engage on a multilateral basis. There are well-established and good working relationships with UK government departments, and my department continues to ensure that NI issues are recognised and fully understood at UK level to help inform UK-EU negotiations. So I welcome this opportunity to update you on the discussions of the meeting which I chaired here in Belfast. The participating ministers were from the UK Government, George Eustace MP, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, the Scottish Government, Fergus Ewing, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Tourism, and Rosanna Cunningham, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Leslie Griffiths, AM, Minister for Environment, Energy and Rural Affairs, was unfortunately unable to participate uh, due to the floods, and the Welsh Government was represented by Mr Tim Render, Director uh, of the Environment and Rural Affairs. In preparation for the EU and rest of the world negotiations, DEFRA officials presented a paper <coughs> that reflected the broad context for trade negotiations in 2020, along with an overarching summary of UKG trade priorities in EFRA areas, highlighting known devolved administration priorities. Ministers from each of the administrations highlighted priority sec sectors and issues, noting the risks of not reaching a trade agreement with the EU. I indicated to the meeting that a deal which consisted of zero tariff and zero quotas would be highly desirable, and highlighted Northern Ireland's unique position in relation to regulatory alignment within the EU. I emphasised the huge fundamental problems for Northern Ireland agri-food business that would be caused by imposing tariffs from GBTNI. The DEFRA Secretary of State, Mr Eustace, recognised the unique Northern Ireland issues in relation to the protocol, east-west trade tariffs. Sa sanitary and phytosanitary SPS checks, market integrity, and agreed these would require a further bilateral meeting to discuss further. I also indicated that it was important to agree the maintenance of a high level of standards in Great Britain to minimise unfair competition from third country imports produced to a lower standard and cost, and to build a reputation of the UK as a safe and reputable source of food supply to global markets. And in particular, I asked how the UK would protect the integrity of the food industry. I was informed by Mr Eustace that the UK would adopt an intelligent and risk-based approach to import control. I, along with ministers <coughs> from other devolved administrations, emphasised the importance of meaningful engagement in the negotiation of new trade agreements. Therefore, I agreed to share documents as early as possible and to encourage other Whitehall departments to do likewise. The meeting then considered the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol and agreed across administration technical work plan to progress this constructively. I raised concerns regarding the significant tariffs that could be incurred um, by the fishing industry. I also sought clarification on what unfettered access to GB would mean for Northern Ireland. To ensure protest domestic preparedness for December 2020, the group also agreed to produce a shared set of planning assumptions to prepare for broad scenarios at the end of the transition period and discuss border preparations and business engagement. I emphasise that devolved administrations need absolute clarity on rules and responsibilities and that confirmation of this should be provided at the next meeting on 23 March 2020. In closing the meeting, we noted the progress of the DEFRA primary legislation programme and acknowledged the highly ambitious programme of secondary legislation required to ensure a fully functioning statute book at the end of the transition period. Following the meeting, I had requested several bilateral meetings in Belfast in the very near future with Mr Eustace, Mr Ewing and Ms Griffiths to discuss in more detail some of the mutual interest in relation to EU exit, such as the Northern Ireland Protocol, tariffs, SPS issues, GBNI trade, integrity of the GB market, 
and risk-based surveillance, along with policy in relation to agri-food, environment and fisheries, and the operation of the UK internal market. Thank you. Thank you, and I call the chairperson of the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Dagla Magalier. And I thank the Minister for his uh, statement here today. Um, one of the issues that had been raised in, in committee and indeed here across this floor last week was that relating to the importance of migrant labour for the industry here. And indeed, I note from the previous meeting that de uh, the from the DEFRA minutes that uh, the Scottish and Welsh ministers had raised the, issue, raised the issue of migrant labour at the previous meeting on the 13th of January. So given the importance of uh, labour from other countries beyond here uh, for the agriculture and the food and drinks industry here, could uh, the minister outline what representation that he has made uh, with, uh, you know, in relation to the, the, the British government, uh, in relation to the, um, the recently announced points-based immigration uh, system that announced by the British Home Office. Thank you. I thank the member for the question. Um, Labour is, is a, of key importance um, to agriculture. We have done some background work to it, and as things stand, uh, only around 9 per cent of people who are currently engaged in the agri-food sector uh, would qualify under the proposed scheme, which would indicate that those people who are here will be fine, but in terms of those people leaving and trying to bring new people in, that would be a substantial challenge. Uh, consequently, we have raised this issue um, <coughs> with the executive. Uh, we have also raised it um, with the relevant minister um, who was uh, over here, the business minister. And uh, the executive are going to take this um, and write to uh, Her Majesty's Government uh, in order to highlight the concerns that we in Northern Ireland have. It is a particular issue for my department and the Department of Health in providing social care. Uh, but in terms of the agri-food industry, uh, much of our, our agri-food industry is reliant on labour which is sourced from outside uh, the United Kingdom. And consequently, uh, for the continuation of many of our businesses, uh, we need to have the opportunity uh, to source the appropriate labour, and that is something which we will continue to lobby and press upon because I do not see what is currently proposed as adequately meeting the needs um, in terms of what we need in, in the agri food industry. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his statement? Uh, does the Minister have a sense of how uh, the other uh, devolved administrations will approach future trade agreements? Well, the other administrations and ourselves will, will all be lobbying the um, UK Government uh, to get a deal which is best suited uh, to us. So, Scottish and Welsh, for example, would be quite concerned in terms of the land trade, um, in that quite a lot of land is exported and there are high producers. Um, of lamb, so they would have their <coughs> concerns in that respect. So ideally, we all get a zero tariff, zero quota deal. Uh, that's going to be difficult to achieve. And my fear going forward is that the level playing field is a significant issue, and the Northern Ireland Protocol is a less significant issue um, for the UK government. And therefore, whatever arrangements come uh, to us will be issues which are more about the level playing field and what suits the UK government on that front and less about the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, which could have a really serious impact uh, for he us here in Northern Ireland. And I call Pat Catney. Um, thank you, Minister, for that statement. Uh, this is an important group given the size of our agri uh, food industry and its impact on our economy. Could the Minister give us an assessment of the British Government's commitment to upholding food standards following the Deputy Minister's comments last week that he would give no assurances of maintaining alignment with safety standards following Brexit? Well, I would be of the opinion that the United Kingdom would be a country which has better food standards and would want to have better food standards than many other parts of the European Union. So, for example, 
whenever we had the horsemeat scandal a number of years ago, that scandal wasn't something which was kicked off in the United Kingdom. That was kicked off in other European countries. And I believe that we will have high standards, both in terms of the environment and in terms of animal health and animal welfare and food standards going forward. The question that has to be asked and the question that Europe has to recognise, do they want equivalence and do they find equivalence acceptable or do they want uh, Britain to rigidly adhere to standards set by the European Union? Because going forward, I believe that British standards on food will be high, um, but they may not be the same or exactly the same as European standards. And do consequently then does that open the door for a whole series of tariffs to be applied, which aren't going to be applied in the case of Canada when it comes to the European Union. So we need a bit of common sense to apply here and not to have some sort of punishment um, of the UK because Europe doesn't want it to be seen to be too good a deal um, as it may be attractive for other countries then to exit the European Union. And I called Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, does the Minister agree that the Northern Ireland Protocol places Northern Ireland at a disadvantage within the UK internal market? Well, at the minute we have around 380,000 HGV movements between Northern Ireland and, and, and GB and GBNI. And consequently, any um, new uh, export health checks um, and export movements that would then be applied from GB to NI in particular will have a detrimental impact. So if we're looking at 50% of our trade roughly going each way, 50% so of trade that Northern Ireland does um, goes to Britain and indeed comes from Britain, then that is very significant because Great Britain is our most significant trading partner. So any barriers that is placed between us and Great Britain will have a greater impact than any barriers elsewhere. So the trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain is absolutely critical and essential. And that's why the proposed protocol that has been put in place is hugely damaging. And that is why I welcome UK government looking for further changes to the protocol. We said that it was told, told to us that it couldn't be changed. Well, it needs to be changed. Because if it isn't changed, there will be a consequence for every business in Northern Ireland. And as a result of that, there will be a consequence for every consumer in Northern Ireland. And that will make life harder for our consumers as a result of the protocol that's placed in terms of higher prices, which will have been imposed as a result of the protocol not as a result of us leaving the European Union. Sorry, I call Phil McGuigan. Uh, can call you, and can I also thank the, the Minister uh, for coming and making the statement today? And I note, just in some of the responses that he's given so far, that he's used the words worrying, uh, consequences, the phrases detrimental impact, uh, serious concerns. Uh, Far, far away from the sunny uplands of Brexit. And, and just in his last statement, he used the, in relation to the protocol, he said the, damaging is, the protocol is damaging. No, it, I would contend that actually it's Brexit that is damaging. It's Brexit that is causing serious concern to our farmers and our agriculture industry here. And I mean, if I could just ask, and given uh, Boris Johnson's recent speech in Greenwich, where he said there's no need for a free trade agreement to involve accepting EU rules on com competition policy, subsidies, social protection, environment, or anything else, uh, more than the EU is obliged to accept UK rules, would the minister agree with me that this uh, contradicts uh, paragraph 12 in his statement uh, with regard to the circumstances that Mr Eustace said in relation to the protocol? Well, in terms of Brexit, that decision has been made and, and we have now 
um, left the European Union. Um, so th that, that argument is done and dusted. There is no point in going, going over that further. Um, it has been well enough argued for three years, um, but that has happened. And in terms of our future trading relationships with the European Union, that is what it is about now. And getting the best trading relationships with the European Union is what is in our interests. And getting the best trading relationships with our key partner, our key trading partner, Great Britain, is in our best interests. So leave all the politics to one side. You don't have to like um, Great Britain. You don't have to like the United Kingdom. You may have a preference to be in the United Ireland. Set all that to the one side. Who do we do our business with? And most of our business is done with Great Britain. Therefore, anything that actually damages that trade is going to cause problems for the people that live here in Northern Ireland. And consequently, we need to minimise any damage that is done. It is hugely unfortunate that the damage that is being done to Northern Ireland in terms of its business and in terms of its consumers is damage that is being enforced upon us by the European Union, who are demanding the following. And consequently, we need to reel back on that. And if the European Union are good to their word that Northern Ireland is really important, and the peace in Northern Ireland is really important, and the people in Northern Ireland is really important, we need the European Union to reel back on creating barriers between Northern Ireland and its number one market for goods. Okay, I call uh, Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I welcome the uh, Minister's commitment to looking forward, setting aside the old debates uh, of the past when it comes to Brexit, the constitutional argument, and I would appeal to members, particularly opposite, to embrace that forward-looking uh, perspective, because it would appear to many of us, Mr. Speaker, that the protocol. Uh, is being used as some kind of instrument to inflict a punishment beating on those that supported Brexit, and Northern Ireland cannot afford to endure that kind of uh, punishment as a result of the decision that was taken. Can the Minister reassure me that he will confront the Tonishta, the Foreign Affairs Minister Simon Coveney, who is putting in jeopardy the trade talks that are starting today through his insistence on infrastructure down the Irish Sea that will create a burden upon our trade between GB and give us the assessment of the damage that he is inflicting on us. Thank the member for the question. In terms of the infrastructure that is being sought for by Simon Coveney, we are looking at tens of thousands of cheques coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, which will create a huge pressure in business. So let me explain. Just in time food supplies fresh strawberries, fresh food of any kind. If that has to be delayed at a port, be it in Scotland or be it in Northern Ireland, and I should say that neither the Northern Ireland Minister nor indeed the Scottish Minister have expressed that they are willing to accept any checks at any ports. And Scotland was as firm as I was in terms of this, that we were putting infrastructure in our ports to facilitate this. But if Mr Coveney had his way, there would be tens of thousands of cheques damaging that just-in-time goods that would be coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, which would be hugely detrimental to uh, the, the, the shops, the convenience stores and the supermarkets who are providing uh, food that has been, been produced in Great Britain and comes to Northern Ireland. And again, that will have a huge impact upon our consumers. Mr Coveney will also impose upon us, as a consequence of his reading of the protocol, huge damage to our fisheries. In that fish that is landed in Northern Ireland, the European Union's current position, is that all fish caught in British waters and landed in Northern Ireland would be subject to tariff. But maybe we would allow you, we might be kind and allow you to catch what is currently under quota and then just tariff the rest. Totally unacceptable. Simon Coveney wants to damage our fishermen. Simon Coveney wants to damage our consumers and our businesses. Simon Coveney could not get a majority in the election just passed. He became third. Boris Johnson got an 80-seat majority 
in the House of Commons. So I don't think Simon Coveney has much clout when it comes to these talks. Yeah, yeah. The clout lies with the UK government going into these talks to fight and to fight hard to ensure that Northern Ireland is not damaged as a consequence of this yeah, protocol. Yeah, yeah. And I call Sinead Ennis. Uh, um, the Minister, you are speaking about the fishing industry there and about the tariffs that may be imposed. Can, can, who, who, can you elaborate more on these tariffs and, and the impact they could have on our fishing industry who are already under severe pressure? So if, if the Minister could just allude to give us a bit more information about the tariffs that, that he's proposing. Well, uh, I know the member will have a particular interest in this issue given that um, two of our main fishing uh, ports happen to be um, in South Down. And the fisheries industry has been emasculated um, for the last 40 years as a result of the European Union. And I thankfully was able to, to raise uh, and create the opportunity um, for fishermen to, to, to fish for haddock uh, last week, which is something which they haven't been allowed to as a consequence of the European Union uh, for many years. Uh, but nonetheless, they have been emasculated and they have been prevented from fishing in their own waters, and fish which they were, should have been entitled to fish was being caught by boats from other European countries. Now, we can have a very good relationship uh, with the Republic of Ireland when it comes to fishing. There's plenty of fish in the Irish Sea for both Northern Ireland fishermen, Republic of Ireland fishermen, um, but we cannot have a situation where the European Union comes in and says that fish was caught in British waters and actually apply to, to, to the, the Irish boats as well. That fish that is caught in British waters, we are going to apply a tariff to it. It's totally and totally unacceptable. Fish caught in the Irish Sea and landed in Kilkeel, in Ardlas, Port of Ogie, and indeed in Belfast must be tariff free and we must be enabled to do that. And that is something which I have impressed upon George Eustace is totally unacceptable. It is what the European Union officials have told to our officials here in, in DERA, something that we cannot contemplate. And I call Mervyn Story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the Minister for uh, coming to the House and giving the statement this morning. Uh, previously, I uh, made reference to the issue of food standards, but before I comment on that, can I welcome his comments? particularly in relation to the fact that through a democratic process uh, we have now left the shackles of the European Union, which has decimated, as he has said, uh, in terms of fishery and many other uh, businesses that have had impositions of draconian rules and regulations. But can the Minister elaborate, and it was mentioned uh, from the member from uh, Lagan Valley, in regards to food standards and protecting the importation of foods into Northern Ireland. Can he ensure that those standards, the high standards which we have here in Northern Ireland, are not jeopardised by anything which would fall short in relation to the importation of goods into Northern Ireland? Well, we do have food at a very high standard here in Northern Ireland. So the, the, the chicken that we, we produce, um, the fish that we catch, the meat that we produce, all of it is done to an excellent standard much higher standards than, than in many other parts of the world where you could get cheap imports from. And I think that the people in our country and, and the people who receive our exports deserve to know that they're receiving the best quality products, that the animal health um, conditions are excellent, that we have good environmental um, conditions, and that the, the actual food product itself is of, of a top quality. And therefore, people um, pay a premium for it, and that is very often the case. Um, so we need to ensure that in free trade negotiations that that continues to be the case. Um, so origin of food needs to be very important, um, and labelling of food needs to be very important, because if free trade negotiations uh, end up with us importing food from another country, which is of a different standard. And if people choose to buy that, that is their choice. But it needs to be absolutely up there in lights um, that this is food that is not produced to the high standard of the food that we have. And consequently, if they want to buy it at a lesser price, that is entirely up to them. But they are buying something which does not meet the same standards and quality that we currently have. 
They call John O'Dowd. Um, uh, as, as the question and answer session flows back and forth, uh, it's quite clear that the benches opposite don't want us to talk about Brexit. But we're dealing with the consequences of Brexit, and we're dealing with the consequences of those who supported Brexit and promised the sunny upper lands coming forward. Is it not the case, and following on from uh, Mr Storey's question, is it not the case that the Irish Protocol actually protects us from the very scenario Mr Storey talks about? And I assume he's talking about my park workers in his own constituency and like my constituency who face job losses if our market is open up to the uh, referred to chlorinated chicken. So, would the Minister not confirm that the Irish Protocol protects our environment, protects our industries and protects our consumers from low quality, cheap imports? Well, the member makes a fair point in that the chicken notes um, would be coming from the United States of America if there was a free trade deal done with the United States of America, is chicken which is more subject to salmonella, and consequently um, that is why it is chlorinated. I don't see millions of people coming back from America um, badly um, affected as a consequence of eating it. But, but, but nonetheless, we produce our chicken to a higher standard, which doesn't need to be chlorinated in the first instance. So that is why labelling is absolutely critical. Origin of food is absolutely critical. It's something that I have sought for years. Currently, there's loads of chicken coming into the European Union from Southeast Asian countries, which produce food, the, the chicken to a lower standard than ours. And much of that ends up in the catering industry. And it isn't well labelled for the people who are buying it. So already it's happening. It's not something which is going to be new. Already it's happening. So we need to be making our argument forcibly that I don't care whether the chicken comes from America, from Thailand, or anywhere else. We need to be identifying where it comes from, the standards that it's been raised to, and for consumers to be able to make that choice <coughs> themselves as to whether they want the locally produced material which is produced to the highest standards, or whether they want to buy something which is of a lower standard, and therefore they pay a lower price for it. Um, and that's a, a decision that consumers will make, uh, not ourselves. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I would like to thank the Minister for his statement and also for the work uh, he is doing in matters pertaining to Brexit on behalf of this Assembly and Executive. In particular, uh, his vocal opposition to barriers and infrastructure at our ports alongside his devolved colleagues. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we must hold Boris Johnson firm to his commitment of free, unfettered trade east-west, given the fact that this Assembly voted unanimously against the Brexit bill when it came before the House. Uh, but could I ask the Minister, if the, protocol, if the protocol is implemented in full, as the EU would suggest, at what cost would this be to the Northern Ireland agri-food sector? Well, we have a circumstance where Northern Ireland is a leader in terms of food production and food processing. And consequently, food which is produced in the, in the, the primary produ by primary producers in Great Britain is brought to Northern Ireland for further processing and adding value to that food. And most of that ends up back in the Great Britain supermarkets. So we have a situation where literally thousands of jobs are involved in adding value to food where the primary producer was a producer in Great Britain. If the EU, for example, were to add a tariff to beef, which is currently around 40%, then the importers of that product would have to pay that tariff and would not be able to reclaim it until 100 per cent of it had left that particular factory. Now, whenever a beef carcass comes in that large form, it is then subdivided into many, many other forms. And it may be that the steaks and the, the stewed beef and all of that there is all back out in the market, and there may be elements of minced beef that hasn't went back or indeed elements, uh, other elements of it. Until 100 per cent of it goes back to the GB market, they can't claim back that tariff. Consequently, a, a, a production system which is working on very fine margins would all of a sudden have massive tariffs 
to actually pay and have to wait for many, many months, maybe in some instances more than 12 months, before they could actually reclaim that tariff. That would do huge detriment to those businesses. So we need to get into a circumstance where we don't have those tariffs applied in the first instance. And it hasn't happened anywhere else in the world where you're going to have tariffs within a country. It's just unacceptable. And we need to press this over and over and over again, the unacceptability of tariffs within a country and tariffs between your key trading partner and yourselves, which is Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister. Given the importance of the GB market to our agri-food business, can the Minister detail what discussions he has had in relation to the term unfettered access? Thank you. Well, unfettered access is, is, is a great terminology. I, I want to know exactly um, what the British government mean by it. Um, unfettered access appears to be any goods from Northern Ireland going to Great Britain. Um, there's no issue. Um, but I'm not absolutely clear that on the goods which is coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, that that is the same. I have pressed repeatedly that it has to be the same. Unfettered access cannot be one way, it has to be a two way flow. Because the consequences, and I have let out some of the consequences, um, of not having that unfettered access um, would be damaging to our consumers, to our businesses. And we cannot accept that. We cannot have a circumstance where something has been imposed upon us is, is going to cost our consumers, many of them living in areas of deprivation, many of them whom for food is one of the biggest uh, spends that they have. And as, as a result of what Leo Varadkar and Simon Coveney um, and the European Union have sought to impose upon us, then people in West Belfast, in Fermanagh South Tyrone, in South Down, in your constituency in Strangford, in my constituency of Lagan Valley, many people who are, need every penny that they have will have to spend more because of what they have imposed upon this country and upon creating a separation and a division uh, between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, which is damaging to consumers. Call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. O'Dowd referred to the benches opposite. Now, perhaps I can. Uh, the minister would agree, I am sure, that unity of approach is important going forward. Given that Sinn Féin opposed entry into the common market, opposed the Single European Act, opposed the Maastricht Treaty, opposed the Lisbon Treaty, opposed the Nice Treaty, were on the anti side in every European constitutional referendum in the Republic of Ireland. Does the Minister agree that it is time that Sinn Féin returned to their original Eurosceptic principles? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, really want the members to suggest that Sinn Féin are a flip-flop party when it comes to the European <laughs> Union. That, that wouldn't be very pleasant of the member, but of course he didn't actually say those words, so we'll, we'll refrain from it. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think that Sinn Féin over the years have reflected that the European Union has not always been about the local worker, it has not always been about the local consumer, and it has not always been about local solutions. It, it, it is a, a large amorphous and it is a, 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 a body which seeks to bring together people from South East Europe um, to Western Europe to Northern Europe. And very often the circumstances that prevail in all of those places at one time are hugely different. So try, applying a single solution to places which are hugely different doesn't always work. And that is a major problem that the European Union has. And to be perfectly honest, it hasn't always worked for Ireland, be it Ireland North or Ireland South. And I think the folks in Ireland South are beginning to wake up to a reality that they're going to be forking out probably over £2 billion pounds to the European Union, having been a net receiver uh, for very many years, and the tables are being turned upon them. And it will be interesting to see how they, they will actually move forward. And the one thing that Ireland South really needs to, to, to be concerned about 
is its trade with Great Britain. Because Great Britain takes huge amounts, particularly of its food product, um, from the Republic of Ireland, and damage to that industry is still, irrespective of all the growth that has taken place uh, in the Republic of Ireland, the food industry is still of crucial importance to its economy. And I want to see a sensible arrangement between the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain. I want to see a sensible agreement between Northern Ireland and Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic. This protocol does not deliver. And therefore, we will argue um, with the United Kingdom government that there needs to be changes and substantial changes. And that will be in the best interests of the consumers here. And I hope that we will do something which will be in the best interests of the people of the Republic of Ireland. I don't believe that the outgoing government in the Republic of Ireland served the best interests of its community uh, in terms of its negotiations. And we could have had and should have had a circumstance where the Republic of Ireland had a very favourable trading conditions with Great Britain and where Northern Ireland had very favourable condi trading conditions as well. But that opportunity was thrown away uh, by the outgoing government. Call Jim Allister. Um, I welcome the Minister's firm declaration that he will not be accepting any infrastructure at our ports, and I look forward to him holding to that. And in consequence, he was right to call out Simon Coveney in respect of what he has been saying. But in that vein, would he not also need to call out three of the parties that he shares the executive with? The Alliance Party, Sinn Féin, and the SDLP have all been adamant that the protocol must be fully enforced and implemented. So do they too not need to be called out for seeking to damage the economy of Northern Ireland? And in that context, could he explain a little more paragraph 17 of his statement, where it says that there will be a cross-administration technical work plan to progress the protocol. What does that mean, a technical work program to progress the protocol? Uh, is that taking us in the direction he doesn't want to go, or how can he ensure that it won't? I thank the member for the question. And of course, people have the democratic right to, to express a, a political position. And the three parties that the member named were, were pro-Romain parties, and that's their absolute right to be pro-Romain parties. And I was a pro-Leave party, and you know, we'll, we'll all know, know in, in due course who was right and who was wrong or, uh, in, in times ahead, uh, whenever all of this is done and dusted, and whether we have a successful economy, which I think we can have a much more successful economy. Um, others may think different, but, but time, time will tell. Uh, but in respect of that, um, even within some of the parties, we have a difference of opinion because in this assembly, um, Sinn Féin voted against, where in the European Union uh, assembly, Sinn Féin voted for. So we had that little um, dichotomy there uh, within Sinn Féin in terms of their voting positions uh, when it came to uh, the deal that, that was put. In terms of the question that the member asks, the protocol is a reality as things stand. We want to see necessary changes applied to it, and that will be part of that discussion that takes place uh, between the member states um, of the United Kingdom, um, that we will be looking for changes to that protocol and will be part of that course of work uh, that the member refers to. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, thank you for your statement. Is it likely that if trade deals are agreed by the UK for the import of agri-food products from countries with lower quality standards, than though, with lower quality standards, that those deals will include a requirement for Northern Ireland to be part of them? They will, yes, um, because we are in the current circumstance where we're part of the single market, but we're also part <coughs> of the GB customs or UK customs arrangements. So we are in a slightly different position um, from everybody else. 
Um, some, some elements of that gives us an advantage. So having the ability to sell um, with zero tariffs to both the EU and to the UK gives us an advantage in terms of um, even businesses that we'd wish to settle in Northern Ireland. Um, we also have disadvantages because our main trading partner is, is potential to be tariffs uh, between that and our main trading partner. Um, so we need to try to um, take advantage of the advantages and, and, and reduce the disadvantages, and, and that's, of course, the work that we'll do. Uh, in terms of if the UK agree to, to acquire food from various countries um, as part of a free trade arrangement, Northern Ireland will be part of that. Uh, so it is absolutely essential and critical because, after all, we produce about five times as much food as we eat, and the majority of that ends up in Great Britain. So it's absolutely critical that, irrespective of whether that food is coming to Northern Ireland or whether that food is coming to Great Britain, um, that its origin um, and the labelling of that food is, is done in a very, very good way. In terms of the United States of America, it is probably one of the best countries in terms of labelling of foods. Um, so I think that that will be less of an issue when it comes to that discussion, because they are good at labelling food. Um, but it is absolutely critical that consumers know what they are getting, what they are paying for, and that they are satisfied to be acquiring that product. Call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you, and, and I too would like to thank the, the Minister for the statement and the information it provides. Uh, I have to say, though, uh, Deputy Speaker, that, that some of the outflow from, from the, the uh, statement and the toing and froing here you know, compels me to say, um, and hope you'll forgive me for not resisting the temptation, that, that never has there been less temptation or opportunity for an I told you so moment. Uh, the Minister and others will be aware that some of us did not want the uncertainty, some of us did not envisage the prospect of a cliff edge, but, but and the Minister referenced it, the protocol is an international agreement and there is some detail for us, all of us, to, to get across between now and the implementation of that protocol. And therefore, rather than protracted pro or anti EU conversations, we should now move in that direction. And I would ask, Deputy Speaker, in relation also to point 17 of, of the uh, statement, um, where this cross administration te technical work plan is tasked to, to deliver, is there any detail or timetable around that delivery, given that we, the clock is ticking and we are moving? Closer and closer to December. Well, I thank the member for the question, and ultimately, uh, I can agree with him on, on some aspects of what he says. Um, so uncertainty is not good, and we're looking towards the end of June to, to, to have wrapped up negotiations and um, to close off that uncertainty. Uh, but the fact that we didn't proceed with what the people's instruction was for over three years created more uncertainty and damage to business than what the next three months will create. So let's get this done. Let's honour the will of the people, um, spoken uh, by referendum, indeed spoken um, in the more recent Westminster election, and actually do what the people have instructed to be done, and that is to leave uh, the European Union, um, to leave it in a way uh, which does least damage to business. Um, uh, what creates the greatest opportunity um, to both business and the community. I think that those of you who want to see failure as a result of leaving the European Union is not a good position to be in. You might not agree with the, the, the decision, you might not agree with the fact that we are leaving it, but we should all be looking for success, because success is to the benefit of all the people that we represent. Failure will damage all of the people that we represent. So let's work together on getting success and not looking for failure to prove a political point. And I thank the Minister as well for his statement. Um, I recognise the importance of unfettered access to the British market, given that 75% of our agri-food products go there. 
Therefore, does the Minister agree that by failing to include minimum food standards in the Agri Bill and plans to phase out farm support payments that the British Government is opening the door to cheap food imports, which will suppress the market and outprice our local farmers and agri-food products from the British market? Thank you. Well, in terms of phasing out farm support prices, I can only go by the, <coughs> excuse me, the Conservative Party manifesto, where it indicated that it would sustain them for the lifetime of this Parliament, and that's all that a manifesto can actually commit to. So, I don't, I'm not aware of this phasing out of, of support for agriculture. Um, I see huge benefits in governments actually supporting agriculture. <coughs> I see huge benefits for the environment because abandonment of land uh, is proven to be very detrimental um, to biodiversity, uh, to the environment, and all of that. So that is not a route that I believe that, that the UK government is going down. And I certainly would be opposed to that, and I think this House will be opposed to it. And we will seek to ensure that that's the case. As it stands, um, we will be distributing um, the, the, the single farm payments this year um, ahead of what we've done under the European Union, because we're capable of delivering everything that we need to um, by October this year, as opposed to wait in December, which was um, imposed upon us uh, through the European Union. I'd say much of the Agri Bill is England centric, um, and England will phase out over the seven years um, some of what they're doing and, and alter that. And one of the things that England is doing and is proposing to do is to actually reduce the payments, the larger payments, and redistribute that. That may be something that we will want to do as well, and that's a discussion that we'll have with the committee in this House as to whether uh, some of the larger payments that was coming. Uh, for some of the single farm payments is appropriate, or whether we invest in young people who want to come into farming and reduce the larger payments as a result of that. Uh, so we may want to do some of the same things as England. We may want to do some things which are completely different from England. I will want to do what's best for the people that I represent, irrespective of what people do elsewhere. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and thank you, Minister, for the statement today. Um, it was good to hear you mention that if the EU were good to the world, that they would act in the best interests of the people in Northern Ireland. I'd maybe like to ask the Minister, does he agree then that if the Conservative government were good to their word, that they would uphold the international treaty that they negotiated and signed off, rather than try and threaten to break it? And can I also ask the Minister, um, can he give us any assurances with this ministerial group um, if he has sought any assurances sorry, since we have seen reports over the weekend that, um, that the Brexiteers are now recommending to the government that um, our food sector was not of critical importance to the country's economy and that agriculture and fisheries certainly aren't? Well, first of all, on the protocol, I'd have to be very surprised if the Green Party would want to have higher food prices and to have businesses detrimentally impacted as a consequence of that protocol, because as things stand, they will be. And it's very clear that they will be. And it's very clear that every single household in Northern Ireland will be worse off as a result of the protocol. And all I hear from the Green Party is more protocol. I think, I think that I would advise that members. We are, sorry, excuse me, Minister. Advise members. No commentary from the seated position, please. Yeah. Well, I, I don't mind, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I don't need any protection from the Green Party or anybody else uh, from sedentary positions or elsewhere. Um, so, so a bit of heckling doesn't really annoy me. But I thank you for 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 for, for your your care and, and interest. But in terms of this, we need to get to the best position. And there is a further negotiation to take place, and I will be imploring the UK government to make the necessary changes to the protocol so that our consumers aren't hurt. And I would trust that the Green Party will stand with the UK government in getting the best deal for the people of Northern Ireland, not accepting a bad deal. Yeah. And that concludes questions on the statement. Now, before we hear the next statement, I would like to advise members that I have received notice. Uh, from the Minister for Health that owing to changes resulting from his meeting with his UK colleagues, 
He is unable to make a statement on the coronavirus until 3.30, immediately after question time. Therefore, if questions on the statement, the subsequent statement we are about to hear from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs concludes before question time at 2 o'clock, business will continue with consideration stage of the Budget Bill and the debate on the Executive's Legislative Programme motion. However, as the Finance Minister won't be available to move their business until half past one, just procedurally, uh, if necessary, we may have to suspend the sitting until that time. Uh, but we'll just that will depend on how we move with the, the next statement. And um, that I now move to that business. Uh, I have received notice from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs that he wishes to make a statement. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for this opportunity to talk to the House about a new programme of forestation. And I trust that it will be one that we will have widespread agreement across the House upon. And uh, there will be maybe a little bit less conflict, but who knows? Um, we will we'll be up for it if, if there is some. As Minister, I have asked for sustainability to be placed at the heart of everything my department does, and that includes the sustainable management of the trees and woodlands in Northern Ireland, which are one of our key natural assets, with an estimated 100,000 kilometres of tree lined hedgerows and 113,000 hectares of woodland, within which approximately 2,000 kilometres of forest tracks and paths are available for public access and broader health benefits. And it's clear, much, uh, people are, it's clear how much people value our forests, and I share that appreciation. We have around 5 million visits to the Department's forest parks each year. However, the level of forest cover in Northern Ireland is currently 8 per cent of land, compared to 13 per cent in the UK, 11 per cent in the Republic of Ireland, and 43 per cent in the European Union. So they're ahead of us in that. There is clear case for expanding forest cover here to support a thriving environment, a strong economy and healthy, active communities. And while this <clears throat> will not be without its challenges and will require partnership working across the executive, the wider public sector and, importantly, support of rural landowners and communities, that does not mean it should not be done. It will also need to be achieved through a coherent policy framework within which agriculture, environmental and afforestation policies clearly complement one another, and this will be a key focus of the Department over the coming months. Planting more trees and increasing forest cover bring a number of benefits to Northern Ireland society. There is clear evidence to support that tree planting contributes to a healthy, quality environment. It can help mitigate <coughs> the climate change by removing carbon from the atmosphere. For example, on average, one hectare of woodland in its lifetime captures 1,200 tonnes of carbon dioxide. It would also improve the landscape and biodiversity and enable more people to improve their health, well-being and life chances by the enjoyment, enjoyment um, of this quality natural resource. Furthermore, it would make a significant contribution to Northern Ireland's sustainable and inclusive economic growth. The gross value added by the forestry sector is around £60 million per annum from timber production activity, sustaining 1,000 rural jobs. <coughs> a further £60 to £80 million is generated in the local economy from forest-based recreation and tourism. The forestry strategy to date has been delivered mainly through successive rural development programmes, encouraging private landowners to convert agricultural land to forestry. This has resulted in the creation of small, predominantly broadleaf woodlands, providing health benefits for the woodland owner, low levels of carbon sequestration potential and biodiversity benefits. The current rates of afforestation, if projected forward, represent only a modest rate of woodland creation, short of 1 per cent by the middle of the century. The Committee on Carbon Climate Change has, been called, has called tree planting a simple, low-cost option to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Its reduced emissions in Northern Ireland report noted that tree planting falls well short of the Committee's recommendation of 900 hectares of woodland per year, compared to the current 200 hectares. The UK Government is committed to achieving net zero carbon by 2050. Climate change is a significant challenge, not only to the UK but globally, and I believe Northern Ireland can make a significant contribution to address these challenges at a local level and through a number of innovative environmental policies, including increased deforestation, which is sustainably managed and better integrated with other land uses. 
Increasing afforestation at the rates necessary to make a meaningful impact on the carbon capture will require a strong partnership approach. And the support of my executive colleagues and members of this House, existing public owned land, <coughs> including local government land, has the greatest potential for woodland creation in the short term. I have written to ministerial colleagues and chief executives of local councils seeking their support and commitment to making public land available for tree planting and to provide an initial assessment as to the scale and extent of the land that may be available. The quality, accessibility and environmentally sensitive <coughs> sensitivity of the land will be key considerations to the sustainability of tree planting. I plan to establish an afforestation forum to work collectively across the public sector to coordinate the assessment of available public land and develop an action plan for increasing afforestation. I will oversee this work personally and the forum will report to me regularly. As a Minister for DERA, I am committed to leading by example. I would like to take this opportunity to advise members of an afforestation event on the 9th of March at which 1,000 trees will be planted by local children on my department's land at Lockery College, Cookstown, and this will be followed by similar legacy events. I will continue to play a key role in increasing afforestation and creating a sustainable environment. Importantly, this enhanced afforestation programme must encourage tree planting and create opportunities to incorporate trees and woodlands into farms and other businesses in a realistic and viable way with the necessary reskilling programme to enable landowners to refocus their land use. <clears throat> with the leadership, commitment, skills and willingness available to us, we should seek to significantly increase forest cover over the next decade. Over the next 10 years, my department will lead a programme of afforestation called Forests for Our Future which will, by 2030, have planted 18 million trees to create 9,000 hectares of new woodland, equivalent to 10 trees per person in Northern Ireland, improve the resilience of Northern Ireland's forests and woodlands, and increase the contribution to a sustainable, healthy environment, increase the contribution of forests and woodlands to Northern Ireland's sustainable and inclusive economic growth, increase the use of Northern Ireland's forest resources to enable more people to improve their health, well-being and life chances, Mr Deputy Speaker, members, the purpose of this statement is to set out my intentions in terms of increasing afforestation, to support climate change and maximise individual community and societal, societal benefits for the citizens of today and future generations to come. I hope that this statement sets out the direction of travel and receives the support of members. As I have previously membered, m mentioned, we must seek to achieve these benefits together. Thank you. Agus Nais Iarim, Sir Las Cairlach, and Christia Fui Cursi Talaviach, the Temple Act, Agus Curhi Tuicha, Philip McGuigan. I now call the Vice Chair of the Committee, the Era uh, Committee, Philip McGuigan. Uh, Las Cairn Collier, uh, Agus, uh, I, I want to thank the Minister for coming and presenting his statement today. Uh, it is a welcome uh, uh, announcement. Uh, given the fact that uh, you know, the North only has 8 per cent of tree cover, particularly compared with 43 per cent uh, across the European Union. So something did need to happen, and I, I welcome, uh, and I'm sure it will be widely welcomed, th this announcement and the ambition contained within it, particularly to plant 18 million trees by 2030. The statement uh, also refers to the Committee on Climate Change and its recent report in February on reducing uh, emissions within the North. Uh, I mean, the Minister will be well aware that tree planting is only one aspect and one part of the complex equation of dealing with climate change. He will be obviously aware that 30 per cent of greenhouse gases emissions in the North come from the agriculture sector. So, Can I ask the Minister uh, if he will tell us if his department is preparing an overarching response to the, climate, uh, or the Committee on Climate Change report? Uh, and in addition, if so, when will that response be given? Um, the member is anticipating um, the next stage, and I would hope to be in a position within um, two or three weeks to be able to come back to this House and develop um, further aspects of the green economy um, that we look forward to, to actually utilising uh, to ensure that we reduce our carbon footprint. And what I do say here in Northern Ireland we have never benefited from oil, gas or coal, so I have no issue whatsoever of moving away from those fossil fuels to a much greener economy. 
and I actually believe that the opportunity exists in Northern Ireland for us to actually be a seller of green energy. That's the contribution um, that we should be looking to make and get to that point. But we can massively, and the member's right, um, the trees will help on those areas where carbon, we can't reduce all carbon. But if we want to actually you know, take this challenge head on, reducing carbon is the biggest element of it. Um, and that is a, a, a course of action uh, that we will identify and move forward with um, over the course of the coming weeks and months. Um, but there's a, there is a course of work to be done there. I've talked to um, my executive colleagues about it. I'm getting great support from them. And it is something that we as an executive will need to embrace and go forward together on. Called William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Board. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister again for her statement? Um, can I ask the Minister, given the vast areas of land that government and local councils own, what steps can your department take to encourage planting in these areas? Uh, the member is right, and there is vast areas. Um, I know that the DFI and, and I've said Mr. Mull has been very willing to, to cooperate with me on this. Um, both water service and, and transport and I have large swathes of land uh, which, which we could potentially use. And uh, all being well, well, that will be the case. Local authorities have, have large swathes of land. And indeed, the arm's length bodies, many of them, have large swathes of land. And the actual planting of trees is not expensive. It's the acquisition of the land that is, is expensive. So if we in Northern Ireland were to acquire um, 700 hectares of land at roughly £25,000 per hectare each year, that would be a huge cost to us. So the logical thing to do is to use the land that's already available to you, and that is what we want to work with other departments. And I trust that other departments will, um, will do that, and I believe that they will, and that the local authorities will do that. Uh, aside from that, um, we need to work with the rural community uh, and, and develop the relationships that we we'll have there to encourage further tree planting uh, on privately owned land. Iram Sir Pat Catney for Hunya Cash to call Pat Catney. Um, thank you again, Minister. Um, the management of our forests and woodlands. I agree with what you've already said. It is an undervalued area of our economy, and it's also critical for our managing our uh, climate impact. Could the minister outline the contributions that he thinks the farming community could make on forest management as a public good contribution to carbon storage and flood plain management? Thank you, Minister. Well, the member raises important points. And, uh, we are currently looking, and, and the department is looking, at how it can actually have a better uh, mapping base of, of, of land in Northern Ireland, and looking at the opportunity of identifying um, through the LIDAR scheme uh, where significant runoffs take place. And those areas would be areas where we would be particularly encouraging uh, farmers to plant trees in, in, in those areas of land. Uh, we would also be looking at um, the areas closest to waterways, because currently farmers are not allowed to, 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 to spread a slurry, for example, within five metres uh, of a waterway. And therefore, uh, we need to work with them and encourage them um, to actually do some tree planting around those, and that will be something which will be beneficial to them, in that they will have um, re reduced opportunities for, for, for any. any uh, pollution off those waterways, um, so that will be to the benefit of, of the farmer in doing that, um, because it lifts the pressure off them that they don't need, and uh, we need to support them in doing that. So having a, a good assessment of land and on, on of land qualities and all of that there, and, on, and of um, the, the various uh, pH and so forth of the soils, um, then we will have, farmers will have a better opportunity to acquire fertiliser and slurry and all of that there and, and apply it appropriately. Um, planting trees in, in key areas of land will also assist farmers to do things in a more environmentally friendly way. And this is a, an area where we can develop those win-wins uh, with the farming community, where they get the appropriate support and where the public get a reduced carbon footprint, get better, <coughs> better and cleaner waters 
uh, and better air quality as well. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, I thank you for your statement. You quote in your statement, Minister, that 60, 60 million to 80 million is generated in the local economy from forest-based uh, recreation and tourism. I was just wondering where you got those figures from and if they've been tested for accuracy. Well, um, they're, they're figures that come from my own department um, who uh, have done a course of work upon this. Um, so in our forest, we have just short of 5 million people um, using our, our forest parks each year in terms of walking, in terms of cycling. We've had the film industry using it. Um, there are some splendid waterways within our forest parks. We have some real gems in Northern Ireland. I think of Castlewell and Tullymore, Hillsborough, Gorton, just and there's many, many more. I'll probably offend people by not mentioning the, the, the beautiful forests that they have in their constituency. Beaver uh, is a, in, a, in their city one, uh, which is a real asset to our city, um, which many cities don't have. So we do have so many forests out there that which are a huge asset and um, to our community and to our economy. Well, John Blair. <coughs> Speaker, thank you, and can I thank the Minister for, for this statement? He has guessed already, of course, correctly, that some of us would be more enthusiastic about this statement than we were uh, on the previous one. Um, in that regard, he was right. And also, I think we should say uh, it's commendable that the, the Minister's personal interest and commitment to this, the Forest of the Future programme are clear from the text of the statement, and, and we genuinely thank him for that. I should add to that that um, it's a very swift follow-up to an early question I asked, I think, at a supplementary. It may have been the Minister's first um, Assembly question time when he promised us announcements soon on forestation. Um, and we look forward to, to future timely delivery on environmental protection and other matters also. Um, the question, Deputy Speaker, is that um, it, it's referred to already in here about, about action plans and working groups, but how best can we secure that the plans are future-proofed and wildlife-proof with regard to um, uh, broadleaf species, for example, and also local wildlife? Well, I certainly think, particularly for those small plantings that, that local farmers would do, that um, you would only give them support to do that um, in instances where it is broadleaf um, species as opposed to commercial species. Now, currently we have a very successful commercial arm in our department, uh, which is growing trees which are harvested and replanted. And that is something which still has significant benefits, uh, but nonetheless, we do want to uh, um, increase the amount of broad leaves that are planted. Um, so much of the work that we will do, for example, with local authorities uh, will be more uh, based upon broad leaves. Um, and indeed with, with, with the private um, landowners uh, will be very much aimed towards broad leaves. Uh, in terms of also, um, the member uh, mentioned sustainability, um, some of the soils we will not want to plant upon because the more peat-based soils um, are lands which, uh, ground which is already um, has a lot of carbon sequestration. So consequently, we will not want to, to be planting trees upon that because that could actually have less um, sequestration in that instance. So we need to be ensuring that it's plant planted on the soils which are appropriate in terms of ensuring that sustainability the member refers to. Call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, I believe it is important to highlight, as the Minister has, the, the important role landowners play already in this area. Following on, does the Minister believe more could be achieved through the Environmental Farming Scheme? Yeah, the Environmental Farming Scheme has, has been um, a good success thus far and has had good uptake. And as we move forward, you know, we will seek to make amendments and changes to it uh, to deliver further success on it. And uh, one of the things that I really want to look at going forward is what is termed riparian boundaries, and that's the boundaries along the rivers. And I indicated earlier that that will be something which will reduce runoff towards rivers um, from the land. So where the land is rich in nutrients, um, more of those nutrients will be kept in, in the soil. And it's important to keep those nutrients in the soil and away from the waterways. And certainly uh, appropriate tree planting 
um, may be something which could assist us in doing that. Um, I too welcome the Minister's statement and I also thank him for the response to my written question on this issue. Um, I'm pleased to see that plans for a forestation, or for an afforestation strategy are being progressed um, as one of the measures has been, has been mentioned in tackling carbon emissions and also the commitments around um, broadleaf native trees to support our biodiversity. But following on from a previous question, tackling the climate emergency requires a framework for climate action which would be underpinned by legislation. Um, and of course, this Assembly has voted to declare a climate emergency and to implement the measures on climate in new decade, new approach. So can the Minister um, advise of the time frame for bringing forward Climate Change Act, please? That's a course of work that um, my officials are looking at. And, and we're not in a position at this stage to, to, to give a, that, that, an outline of that programme. Um, I will be bringing forward other issues which will demonstrate our commitment uh, to having a, a quality environment in Northern Ireland, an enhanced environment in Northern Ireland, where we will have cleaner waterways, we will have cleaner air, uh, and we will have a reduced carbon footprint. And all of that is achievable uh, by taking uh, necessary steps. Some will be small steps, some will be larger steps, uh, but nonetheless, um, we will be taking those steps. This is one of the important steps that we're taking. I trust that uh, <clears throat> the BBC, for example, will recognise that as an important step and not a waste from, of money, because there was a programme, I think, last week went out, uh, which was slamming this assembly for wanting to plant trees. And I think they put a cost of something like £10 per tree in terms of, of, of the cost of planting trees. We can actually acquire the whips for around 50 pence per tree. It is not a huge expense to the public purse. It is a benefit to the public purse. And I trust that the BBC uh, will reflect on the, the stupidity and the fallacy uh, of a lot of the issues that they raised when it came to New Deal, New Approach and to our uh, commitment to actually planting more trees and making this a better environment in Northern Ireland. Call Paul Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I welcome the, the Minister's statement today and the announcements contained uh, within it? I think it's vital that we uh, enhance the natural habitat, the benefits that it brings to the environment, the benefits that it brings to getting people out of their workplaces, off their uh, technology devices and just embracing the natural habitat around them. So this is a very welcome uh, uh, statement uh, by the Minister. Surprised the Minister didn't mention Hillsborough Forest Park in his own constituency earlier when he named a number of others. Uh, but can I welcome uh, the, uh, the, the ongoing work taking place at Hillsborough Forest Park uh, and opening that up to greater accessibility and the improvements to it uh, is something that I know the community there will be looking forward to. Could the Minister indicate if he would have any uh, plans in the future to look at how you can widen the accessibility uh, to the assets that exist within the forest service so that we have greater community accessibility uh, and when it comes to the organization of events that we maximize the number of people that can avail of the facilities that exist and reassure the community that the forest service isn't just about trees well i, I do think that the forest service in recent years, predating me, ha has been engaging better um, with the community, and, and for years it was just about the trees and not about the people who were benefiting from it. Um, so, you know, the, mem the member mentions Hillsborough. The biggest problem that we have in Hillsborough is that we're attracting twice as many people as was predicted. So, the success of it, the, the numbers of people who are wanting to come um, to these facilities is phenomenal. Um, I was recently up in, in South Tyrone, uh, Brantry and wonderful new paths created there and being well utilised by members of the public. And, and one of the things that really encourages me is the numbers of people who, were dis who are disabled and previously couldn't use the paths. The paths are now being made disabled friendly so people can travel around uh, those forests and that, that, that's a huge success. I know that many people engage in, in uh, mountain biking in forests and while it's a sport that I wouldn't necessarily recommend because there's quite a lot of injuries in it, Nonetheless, people get real enjoyment from it, and Forest Service have been more facilitating in recent years on that front. And I know that in a number of our forest parks, um, that, for example, 
there is youth camps in the summertime uh, and where young people go and spend um, a number of days um, in a youth camp in a, in, in a forest park. What better place could they be in that natural environment, enjoying the, the biodiversity, enjoying the beautiful rivers that run, run through our forest parks uh, and seeing all of the, the wildlife that exists within it? And that is something which I would wish to encourage, that we have more young people um, getting out into our forest parks. These need to be a resource which is there for all of our community. And I think that we are building towards that, but there's more work to be done. Uh, Grandma, I got uh, Concordia, uh, the last speaker sort of alluded to what I was going to mention. Um, and I, I actually note and welcome the fact that we have in the region of 5 million visitors to the forest parks each year, and it generates 60 to 80 million um, if, uh, you know, through forest based recreation and tourism. And there is some good examples, and I'm glad the Minister mentioned the, the Gurchin Lens Forest Park down in my own area, which was a fantastic example of partnership working between his Forest Service and from Anomal Council delivered an absolutely fantastic product. And just just last week, I facilitated a group of people from the, the Kappa Village Re Re Regeneration Group uh, with for, uh, from Anoma Council. To t they're looking at realising the potential of the Altmore Forest, 587 hectares, which straddles the Anoma District and the Middle District. district. So, as part of the Minister's uh, Forest for the Future strategy, will he give a commitment to build on the excellent work the, that he has been engaged, his department has been engaged in with local councils and with local communities? And will, will he perhaps commit to bring back a report uh, in the future as to what are his plans to build and, and develop and grow on this uh, partnership working? Grandma Augit. Happy to give uh, the member that assurance that we will seek to build upon that. And I have to say that. Um, we, could probably, well, we couldn't do it without the assistance of local government, and they've really stepped up to the plate in, in, in pr providing additional funding and resource to actually make better utilisation of these facilities. And that's partnership working, and that's how things should work. We've got a wonderful asset, not being quite as well utilised as what it could be, local government coming in and assisting us in opening up on that utilisation. So I want to continue to, to work on, on, on those types of programmes uh, to ensure that the general public um, can enjoy that rich asset that belongs to them. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that statement. Um, fortunately, I didn't get in uh, quickly enough to ask him a question in his previous statement, but perhaps for both of us, uh, in the interests of agreement, this is, it's a little better I'm asking him on this one because um, there's probably a degree uh, more consensus. Um, so I welcome his, his statement um, and the, the sentiment behind him. Can I ask him what conversations he has had or intends to have with Belfast City Council? Um, he's mentioned, um, he mentioned, or one of his colleagues, I think my constituency colleague behind him mentioned Beaver Forest. It's, this isn't just about rural areas. Um, Belfast City Council last year, there was uh, the Million Trees Initiative was passed with, I think, cross-party support. So it would be useful to have a, uh, an indication from him about what conversations he's had with Belfast City Council about supporting that Million Trees Initiative and ensuring that urban forests are developed in a way that's beneficial for everyone. Well, the current practice to engage with local council um, delivery uh, practitioners, and it's proved very successful. And we have signed a series of memorandum of understandings. Um, some 85 per cent of, of, of uh, th those recent understandings have, have led um, to real beneficial change uh, within our, our forest parks. And, uh, we have engaged with Belfast City Council, and that engagement will continue to see how we can further enhance that. Belfast, I believe, wants to plant one million trees, so we are more than happy to work with them, to support them, to lend them expertise and facilitate them. Um, and, it's, and, and, and how we can do that, and uh, that takes us one seventeenth or one eighteenth of the way there, with another seventeen eighteenths to go uh, beyond what Belfast City Council want to do. So, if uh, every constituency uh, was to plant a million trees, uh, then would be there. So that would put four million to Belfast. But nonetheless, we understand that there's less land availability there, uh, and a million trees would certainly be a huge asset to the city of Belfast. We're happy to work with them on that. Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you again, Minister. Would the Minister outline what schemes his department currently have in place to encourage afforestation? Thank you. Um, well, there are a number of schemes um, with local farming community. 
Um, the Forest Service itself has been constantly and steadily plant planting trees um, and seeking to acquire land to plant trees. But acquiring land is, is, is so expensive um, that it actually holds back the work that you can do in a forest station. So uh, I'm looking at a change of focus and how we can actually identify pockets of unutilised land um, currently within uh, you know, a whole range of departments other than DERA uh, to see how we can quickly get wins when it comes to afforestation. And uh, some of those land portions could be quite substantial, um, particularly um, uh, lands relating to, to, to water service in particular. Uh, but we need cooperation from all of those organisations, and I trust that we will get that uh, cooperation from those organisations. Um, and we will continue to introduce schemes uh, which will encourage and support uh, the planting of forests. Here, Mr. Cahill Boylan, for your cash, I call Cahill Boylan. Gorm, I'll get the last one, call you. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister's statement uh, for the statement and could I welcome the statement? I'm just uh, wondering maybe the Minister could expand a wee bit on uh, whether or not he intends to roll this out. And, into uh, using local councils to encourage local community groups and also school children to roll out this program, obviously give them a bit of ownership, and I think it would be a better program if we, if we look towards rolling it out that way. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, the tree planting that we want to um, encourage young people to become engaged in it. So we're working with the Department of Education and indeed the Department for Economy because uh, of, of the colleges. Um, but we want to encourage young people to participate in this. Young people have a real interest in environmental issues. Uh, they have a real interest in having a, a cleaner, greener environment. And uh, this is one element where uh, young people can get involved in tree planting and in, in, in doing courses of work. Um, so we will encourage that. Uh, we will encourage local communities to get involved. Uh, the local authorities have, you know, are, are much better placed than we are uh, to assist us in doing that. I'm surprised the, the member didn't mention the, the Ring of Gullion Forest Park you know, when he was on his feet, but I know that's another fantastic asset that um, many people um, have used, and it's good to see it opened up in that way. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to pay tribute to the Minister for this positive statement. I can think of no better place than this beautiful wood inspired environment uh, to announce uh, positive action in relation to afforestation. I, I want to draw a particular attention uh, to the Department's forest parks that he mentioned. And put a note my own local constituency and indeed the, the surrounding area of Peatlands Park and Lockall Park. The Minister has quoted uh, visitor numbers on 5 million and how uh, the positive lifestyles and, and fitness regimes that, that can, these parks can provide. Biggest obstacle being uh, access in many areas, and, and in particular those areas in the winter months. Would the Minister commit to, to looking at potential ways in which we can open up our uh, parks within his department uh, for better access and therefore boosting the numbers that can get the benefit of these tree inspired environments? Well, that is the course of work that uh, local engagement with the local authorities has helped us to deliver upon. And I understand that, particularly after a month of weather that we've just had, that some of our um, assets may just be a little trickier to access than perhaps others at this stage. Um, so we want to, to create a facility uh, which is available 365 days of the year. And uh, that is certainly something that we'll be happy to work with local authorities on and creating the opportunities uh, for them to actually maximise the usage of the wonderful assets that exist uh, in their local community. Here, Mr. Mark Durkin, for whom you cashed, I call Mark Durkin. I'd like to thank the Minister for this very positive statement that brings to mind the old proverb that was quoted here recently upon the passing of Seamus Mallon, that the society grows great when old men plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. Now, I think we have quite a long way to go before we can be considered great. And of course, the minister has a wee bit to go before he can be considered old. But what I would like to ask the minister is, now he has spoken about working with local authorities and other, all other departments. Could I ask him in particular about what work could be done with DFI on planning policy? 
and at local councils as they form their local development plans around making a, a, a enshrining a requirement in planning in terms of some applications that, that, that they have to plant what they're planning as well. I uh, thank the member and uh, I thank the member for not accusing me of being old yet. I think it's all relative uh, to an 80 year old I'm young and to a 20 year old I'm old. So given that the member is closer to my age, he probably doesn't see, see the old bit, but the young people would probably see us as uh, not being young anyway. But nonetheless, that's all on the side. <clears throat> in terms of planning policy, in built up areas, trees are more challenging. So I would suspect that most members have had lobbies about getting um, trees taken away and so forth because of uh, roots going through footpaths and uh, shedding on, on, on people's roofs and causing problems. So tree planting in, in urban areas um, and especially identifying it through planning needs to be done in a way which has the appropriate um, trees and it also needs to be done in a way where we cause good impacts as opposed to negative impacts upon the people who are going to be living in those areas because they don't really want to be you know, insisting on trees being planted only for 20 years time somebody will come with a chainsaw and have to whack them all down. So we do need to get it right and we are happy to work with the Department of Infrastructure in terms of the planning uh, side of it. Uh, to ensure that <coughs> the local authorities, planning divisions, um, do look at these issues appropriately. Uh, of course, we have green areas that are, that are left in, in um, new builds nowadays, and how we can have appropriate planting, planting of trees in those areas. Um, there's nothing to beat driving through a city with a broad, broad avenue and trees lined up either side of it. I think it looks fantastic. Um, so we need to ensure uh, that we can have that appropriate planting. Um, of trees in our urban areas. Call Christopher Stolford. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would like to associate myself with the remarks that the minister made about the appalling cynicism that we heard on the BBC last week. I think it was disgraceful. Can I ask the minister what assessment has been made of the long-term health benefits for the population, particularly in urban areas, as a consequence of planting more trees? Well, everybody knows that trees have, have, have major benefits and they do suck carbon out, 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 of, out of the atmosphere, as does grass, by the way, um, through photosynthesis into our soils. And that, that, that is something which is of real importance uh, to us that that happens. Uh, but getting people out into a forested area where the air is cleaner um, and, <coughs> and where they're getting activity is a real health benefit. And therefore, you know, in its constituency, the, the, the Beaver Forest Park is such a, a massive asset to have in any city that most cities don't have the opportunity of having a forest park contained within it. Some people would see that as valuable development land. We see it as valuable environmental uh, land, which is being appropriately utilised in an urban setting. Sir John O'Dowd, for your cash, I call John O'Dowd. Uh, Carmi, I can call you. Uh, the, the minister will be delighted to know that I'm going to bring the subject back to Brexit. Uh, to, just to end on a happy note, the, the minister refers to in a statement the, the successful implementation of the rural development programmes. They won't be successful without European funding. So, how is the minister going to replace that funding to continue? Which I have to say is a very welcome statement, and I welcome the fact that the minister is going to take a lead role uh, in this programme. But Everything requires money. And we have argued for £340 billion, which is associated with the European Union, um, to be come directly from Westminster, and that's, that's the argument that we are making, um, that it will not be going into the Barnett formula. That is money that is separately apportioned. And uh, the Finance Minister will be making that argument as well, I understand. And I'll be working closely with the Finance Minister, ensuring that we maximise um, all, that, all that we can get for that. And uh, I trust that we will be able to move forward uh, together in the best interests of all of the people that we serve in that instance. I call Claire Bailey. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the statement. Um, and I'd like to just say that it's really welcome to see the Minister moving so swiftly and taking action in um, reforestation across Northern Ireland. Um, as somebody who lives in the boundary of Beaver Forest and spent the weekend in Craigie Glen, I have to say that the, the work by many agencies uh, looking after our spaces um, is to be commended as well. And when I hear that, you know, you're going to be planting, or you're, you could plant another million trees in Belfast. It is great because I think everybody benefits from having those spaces. Um, I was going to ask the minister about the land be, um, identified for planting. I think you've already addressed that. Um, I was, you know, in terms of not planting on land that can release more more carbon than the trees would capture. So I'll maybe take this opportunity and ask the minister um, if he could give us any updates on his department working to establish an independent environment protection agency, as was voted for in the House a few weeks back. It's slightly off subject, but it's a course of work that we are looking at. Um, in particular, um, we we'll have an environment bill coming forward, um, which will identify um, the need for replacement, for example, of the work that the European Commission does. So, um, there will be an office um, for the environment uh, established as a result of that, which will be wholly independent um, of government, um, and that's one of the areas um, that we're looking at in terms of the uh, history establishment of an independent environment agency. Call Jim Allister. Well, there may be much that's laudable about this proposal. I've heard very little reference to costing. Is there a business case? For this policy, does it involve taking any land into public ownership? Is there any assessment of the husbandry costs involved? Um, those are the sort of things we haven't heard about. And if it's about, in part, incentivising farmers to grow uh, trees, what will be the nature of that incentivisation, and will it have any adverse impact on food production? And finally. Is this statement and its proposal linked to what has been grandly called the Great Ulster Forest, which was in New Deal, New Approach, supposedly something to do with the centenary? Is this what the, the Great Ulster Forest is, or is there some other proposition? And if there is, what's the relationship with them? Well, certainly uh, all of our station will be contained within this, um, so we can have um, a significant planting um, to mark uh, 2021, and I would hope that that will be there in 100 years' time, still in Northern Ireland, uh, for people to enjoy and celebrate. Um, but in terms of the, uh, what benefit there is to, to the farming community, uh, there is um, grant aid um, for woodland creation already. And that can be integrated into the whole farm management programme, which complements the, the agricultural value. Um, now, in many instances, uh, farmers like sheltered places for young calves, for example, um, to, to, to shelter in, and uh, that can be a real benefit, providing buffer strips, um, which will actually reduce the risk of accidental breaches of water pollution and biosecurity standards. Um, we can reduce ammonia loss to the atmosphere from, from point sources, and in some areas we will convert steep slopes, which are hazardous for farming on, um, and areas which are unproductive and are currently just growing bracken and gorse, um, which can be um, translated into trees. And those are all areas where we can work with uh, the private landowners in developing. We can work with our own government bodies in developing some of those areas um, where land is not well utilised at this moment in time. I am sure the member would welcome us planting trees on that and improving uh, the opportunities of uh, capturing carbon and, and environmental improvements as a result of it. I do not think there is any real dispute uh, that trees are not a real benefit to a community and that we can appropriately um, deliver a better forested Northern Ireland in line with uh, our network of hedgerows 
and create a real um, beneficial place uh, environmentally, aesthetically, uh, and in terms of encouraging tourists to come to Northern Ireland, um, we have major benefits uh, from going down a program like this. The estimated cost would be around 80 million over the 10 years. Here I'm Sir Jerry Carroll. For your question, I call Jerry Carroll. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister stated correctly that uh, removing carbon from the atmosphere is essential, and afforestation obviously provides an opportunity to do so. Does the Minister also agree with me that rewetting the drained bogs and bogland is also essential to tackling climate change to act as a huge uh, carbon sink? Well, it's certainly something that will capture more carbon. Um, it's a little controversial in uh, that it may involve other people's lands, and therefore it is something that uh, we need to look at, um, but need to be working with other people in, in, in doing that. And it's something that uh, we would need to exercise due caution in that respect. Uh, but nonetheless, um, there is a, an, a benefit, a carbon a benefit, in, in further wetting our, our wetlands. And, uh, but there are challenges in relation to that.